uh, thank you everybody for being here um, and uh, another uh, week of Otter, another wonderful Otter talk ahead of us. Um, today we have uh, Priyanka giving us a talk on quantum graphs um, and uh, she's coming to us from Texas A&M University and uh, we're all super excited to hear what she has to say. So uh, take it away Priyanka. Thank you, Doc. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. I mean, probably good afternoon. Uh, so I am Priyanga Ganesan, and I'm a graduate student at Texas A&M University. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about quantum graphs, which is the primary um, research of my dissertation. And this is joint work with my advisor, Mike Pranan and Sam Harris. Um, and thank you to the author organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, I hope you guys like my talk. Um, so the goal of my talk is first to motivate the quantum analog of a classical graph, which is exactly what quantum graphs are, and then talk about their significance in information theory. So why are these interesting objects and what applications do they have? And then come to a more mathematical side of it. So looking at different uh, approaches to studying quantum graphs through operator algebras and non-commutative topology and so on. And then towards the very end, I'll describe a quantum coloring problem that I'm currently working on. So first let's begin with recalling what a classical graph is. So a classical graph has two main components, vertices and edges. Vertices are like points and edges are like lines connecting those points. Um, so here is an example of a simple classical graph on three vertices. So the vertex set is one, two, and three. And then there are edges uh, represented by the tuple one comma two and one comma three. And so the structure of a graph can be represented using a matrix, which is known as the adjacency matrix. The size of the adjacency matrix is a uh, it's a square matrix whose size is like the number of vertices in the graph and the entries are zeros and ones. So the position of zeros represent when there is no edge between two vertices and the position of the ones represent when there is an edge. So for example, here there is, a, there is an edge between one and two. So there is a one in the first row, second column. And similarly, um, since the graph is undirected, there is an edge from two to one. So there is also one in the second row first position. And since there is no edge between two and three, there's zero in the second row, third column, and so on. So the entire structure of a classical graph can be represented using a single matrix, which is known as the adjacency matrix. Now, if you think about it, um, there is nothing particular about the choice of the number one. It could have been any non-zero complex number and we would still extract the same information from this matrix. So what we can do is instead of using ones in the adjacency matrix, we can replace it with any non-zero complex number. And in fact, they can be all different numbers. As long as they are non-zero, we would still be able to recover the structure of the graph. So this is one way you can generalize the adjacency matrix. And so um, quantum graphs, uh, are defined using this motivation. So you look at the set of all matrices of this form, uh, like the structure of the adjacency matrix, where you replace the ones by any complex valued numbers. They can even have zero position, they can also have zero values, but now you're looking at an entire set um, of matrices whose structure is similar to the adjacency matrix. Now, since you're allowing zeros in these positions, a single matrix here is no longer going to give you information about the structure of the graph because there are zero values anywhere. But then the set as a whole gives you the same information as the adjacency matrix, because even if there is a single matrix in this set that has a non-zero entry in some position, then that would mean that those two vertices are connected by an edge. So the set as a whole still does the same job as the adjacency matrix. And the reason why we allow these stars to be complex valued numbers, including zero values, is because in that case, this set will be a subspace um, in the set of uh, complex, dimen complex matrices of the appropriate dimension. So in this particular example, for this classical graph G, I can define a set SG as given here, and it's going to be a subspace. And this is exactly the idea of a quantum graph or a non-commutative graph. 
So in the particular case, when the graph is reflexive, which means that every vertex is connected to itself by an edge, uh, you also have entries along the diagonal because there are loops uh, about each vertex. So in this case, in addition to being a linear subspace, this set SG also contains the identity matrix um, because the graph is reflexive. And if we assume that the graph is undirected, then the set SG is also closed and an adjoint. So, um, so this set SG defined for a given classical graph G has three nice properties, which is it's a linear subspace and then it self adjoint, it's closed under adjoint and then it contains the identity matrix. So these three properties together make this an operator system. And that is exactly the definition of a quantum graph. So an operator system in general is a subspace in B of H, bounded operators over a Hilbert space, such that it contains the identity operator and it's closed under adjoint. So as we just saw that when you define a subspace like this from a graph, it's going to be an operator system. So this is the primary uh, motivation for defining a quantum graph. So you begin with a classical graph G with a vertex set, let's say one to N, then you can define a, a non-commutative graph associated with this classical graph as follows. So you define a set SG, which is the linear span of matrix units EIJ. So EIJ are those matrices that have a one in the ith row, jth column, and all other entries are zero. So span of such matrix units where the IJs represent either edges in the graph or the diagonal entries. Uh, and as we saw in the previous example, such a space is going to be an operator system in this matrix algebra. And so this is the primary example of a quantum graph. Um, but more generally, any operator system in this matrix al in a matrix algebra is known as a matrix quantum graph. So uh, the block above gives you a particular class of quantum graphs and the one below is a more broader class of quantum graphs. So not every operator system comes from a classical graph. So this is a broader family here, but any operator system in general is called a matrix quantum graph. So why are we interested in such objects? Um, so one reason is um, they are interesting objects in information theory. So matrix quantum graphs generalize what is known as confusibility graph of classical channels. So um, in classical communication or in zero order classical communication, we use some uh, objects known as confusibility graphs um, to try to understand the uh, error or confusion that happens during information transmission. And so when you look at the quantum analog of this, so when you're instead working with quantum communication, then the analogous uh, objects in this setting are quantum graphs. So uh, in order to understand this better, we would need to dive in uh, a little bit into classical communication and quantum communication. So classically, um, um, so what is a classical channel? So let's look at a simple example. Um, we have some input messages. We can think of these as a set of alphabets. So X1, X2, XM. And then we transmit them through a channel that you can think of as like sending messages through a wire. And then we receive some output messages, which is also a set of alphabets, Y1, Y2, Yn. Now, when information passes through this channel, there is a, there is a possibility of noise. And so there is some confusion as to what would be uh, the output when a certain input is transmitted. So there is an associated probability for each transmission. So the probability that the output is Y, given that the input is X, um, is given to us. So what this means is that the same input message might be delivered as several different outputs, depending on what noise is being, gets added to the channel during transmission. So Classically, a channel is a matrix that contains these probability transition values. Um, so the probability for each pair X and Y. So that is how we should think of a classical channel. 
Now, if you have a classical channel, which is just a matrix of these probability transition values, you can define a corresponding confusability graph for that channel as follows. So this is a classical graph whose vertex set is the set of all input messages of the channel. So X1, X2, XM, and so on. And the edges are defined as follows. So two vertices are connected by an edge if they can lead to the same output, or if there is a possibility of confusing those two input messages upon transmission. So mathematically speaking, we would say that the vertex Xi is connected to an is connected to xj by an edge if there exists an output y such that there is a non-zero probability that xi gets transmitted as y and xj gets transmitted as y so here is a simple example uh, let's say we have five input messages x1 x2 all the way up to x5 and we have some output messages y1 to y5 so you can draw a corresponding confusability graph for this channel. So the vertices of this graph are the input messages, x1, x2, x3, and so on. And two vertices are connected by an edge if they can lead to the same output. So since x1 and x2 might both be delivered as y1, they are connected by an edge. But since x1 and x5 never lead to the same output, so they are not connected by an edge. So what this means is x1 and x2 can be confused upon transmission. Um, and trivially, by this very definition, every vertex is connected to itself because it can be trivially confused with itself by this definition. So there is also a loop around each of these vertices. So the confusability graph of a classical channel is just a reflexive graph. Okay, so now... If we think about this exact same structure in the quantum communication setting, we will get a quantum graph. So what is a quantum channel? So in quantum communication, we are sending quantum states to quantum states. And um, we can, for this talk, we can think of quantum states as positive matrices with trace one. Um, so a quantum channel is one that would take a positive matrix to a positive matrix and it also preserves trace. So basically it's a linear map that is trace preserving because we want states to go to states and is also positive. But in addition to positivity, we want that all amplifications of this map are also positive because um, often there is some coupling with the environment due to noise. And so we want all such amplifications of this map also to be positive. So that gives us the uh, condition of complete positivity. So in summary, a quantum channel is a linear map that is trace preserving and completely positive. So in short, we call them CPTP maps. And there are different ways to represent CPTP maps. And the one that I am going to use for this talk is the Krauss representation. So um, a CPTP map, any completely positive map can be written in this form as a linear span of conjugations by some operators. Um, but in addition, when the map is also trace preserving, then these Krauss operators satisfy this condition as well. So for me, a quantum channels are just linear maps that are of this form and satisfy this condition. Um, and in general, this Krauss decomposition, the operators Ki are not unique for a given quantum channel phi. Um, so that you can represent the same map using different Krauss operators. Okay, so how does the classical picture look in the quantum, quantum setting? So let's say we have some input messages, one to M, and some output messages, one to N. So in the classical setting, you would think of this input message as a unit vector. So if you want to, let's say, transmit the ith message, you would encode it as a unit vector that has one in the ith position and zeros everywhere else. And similarly, output messages are also um, encoded as unit vectors. And then the classical channel itself phi, which is basically a matrix containing probability transition values, acts on these unit vectors to give us the outputs. So uh, if you have an input message, V, then you multiply this 
matrix P with P and get the output message. So this is how uh, classically messages would be transmitted. In the quantum setting, each of these input messages are encoded as matrix units. So basically diagonal matrices that have one in the ith position and then zero everywhere else. And similarly, output messages are also diagonal matrix units. And in this case, the way the quantum channel acts on these input messages is by this map here. So you have some cross operators defined as these. So these are basically some uh, unit matrices that have coefficients from these probability transition values. And then the map V is defined by this. And um, this is how a quantum channel would act on these messages. Now in the classical case, the confusability graph was defined like this. Two input messages A and C are connected by an edge. If there is an output B such that both A and C um, lead to the same output B. So basically the probability that A goes to B and C goes to B is non-zero. Now, if you take this exact same condition and apply it in the quantum setting, then that condition translates to saying that um, the product of these Krauss operators is non-zero. So, uh, so the correct way or uh, the way to define the quantum analog of the confusability graph would be using this definition. So it's the span of product of these matrix, uh, sorry, product of these Krauss operators, K star AB and KCD, because um, that is the exact analog of the same condition in the classical setting. So this is the original definition of a quantum graph as it was first introduced um, in the literature in information theory. So as the non-commutative analog of the confusability graph. So here is that formal definition. So it was known as non-commutative confusability graph and introduced by Duan, Severini and Winter in 2013. So you begin with a quantum channel phi from the matrix algebra, from like one matrix algebra to another with a certain cross representation. Then the confusability graph of that classic of that quantum channel is defined to be this operator system, uh, which is the span of the products of such cross operators. And so um, you can check that this set S phi is going to be an operator system in MM. And although this definition is phrased in terms of the particular representation that we use, one can show that it's um, effectively independent of this representation. So even if you choose a different representation for the quantum channel, you would still get an isomorphic operator system. Um, and conversely, if you begin with any operator system, um, you, you can um, get a corresponding quantum channel for which it would be the non-commutative confusability graph. So if you begin with an operator system S, then you can find a quantum channel psi such that this operator system is exactly the non-commutative confusability graph of that quantum channel. So there is a very nice correspondence between operator systems and uh, the confusability graph of quantum channels. And so what can we do with these uh, quantum graphs? So quantum graphs are used for zero error communication. So the goal in zero error communication is to transmit messages through a channel without confusion. Um, so here, um, look at the same example of the confusability graph that we saw earlier. So two input messages, X, uh, Xi and Xj are not confusable if and only if they do not lead to the same output, which means they are not connected by an edge in this confusability graph. So if you want to, know how many messages you can transmit through this uh, channel without confusion, then we would be interested in the maximum, uh, in the largest possible subset um, of these vertices that are mutually non-adjacent. So basically uh, that would be the independence number of the classical graph G. Uh, and physically it would represent the maximum number of messages that can be transmitted through the channel without confusion. 
And in information theoretic language, this is known as the one shot zero error capacity of the channel feed. So, um, so now this entire idea of zero error communication has been translated through a graph theoretic concept, which is the independence number of the graph G, which is just the uh, maximum number of vertices that are mutually not connected by an edge. So similarly, in the quantum case, we can think about uh, what would this condition of non-confusability mean? So if you begin with two quantum states, we say that they are distinguishable if they are orthogonal. Um, so they're distinguishable, distinguishable means that there is a quantum measurement that you can make that would um, distinguish them. And so in mathematical terms, this would reduce to an orthogonality condition. So what happens here is that you begin with an input message X and you encode it as a diagonal matrix unit, so a quantum state. And then these two input messages will not be confusable upon transmission if their outputs messages are distinguishable. So meaning that these two output messages are orthogonal with respect to the Hilbert Schmidt inner product. And so you can do a little computation to see what this orthogonality condition reduces to. And that would say that, um, that would show you that this uh, matrix unit EXY, so this is written in Brian Kett notation, but this is essentially just the matrix unit that has one in the exit row and yth column and zero everywhere else. So this matrix unit should be uh, orthogonal to all such Kraus, a product of Kraus operators, K star J, K I. So basically, since our uh, quantum graph is just the linear span of such products, this non-confusability condition reduces to saying that two input messages are not confusable if and only if this matrix unit that we get from those input messages is orthogonal to the quantum graph or to this operator system. So basically knowing more about this operator system or the quantum graph will help us find more ways of transmitting information through this quantum channel without confusion. Okay, so that was a long uh, a digression into the information theoretic side of quantum graphs. So now let's move on to more of a math uh, operator algebra side. So there are different ways of studying quantum graphs um, in, in the literature. And so I've listed some of them here. So the first is um, looking at quantum graphs as the non-commutative analog of confusibility graphs. So this is how it was originally introduced by Duan, Severini and Winter um, as the quantum version of the confusibility graph of, quantum, of classical channels. And so here we use the language of matrix quantum graphs and operator systems. Now, another way of studying quantum graphs is looking at them as um, the quantization of the edge set. So this is done using uh, the language of quantum relations and it was introduced by Nick Weaver um, in his study of quantum relations. And so we look at this in a moment on the next slide. And then the third way of looking at quantum graphs is as the non-commutative analog of adjacency matrix. So basically we are using all the three components of a classical graph and looking at those quantum versions to get a quantum graph. So that is why you have three different approaches. Uh, and this was given by Musto, Reuter and Verdon and they used this categorical theory of quantum sets and quantum functions for this uh, perspective. Now, although these are three different approaches, they have a very nice fine connection between them using projections. So in each of these different approaches, you can define projections in a suitable way. In the first case, you can define a projection onto the operator system. In the second case, you can define a projection that would be uh, a quantization of the characteristic function on the edge set. And then in the third case, you can define a projection map using the quantum adjacency matrix. So um, you get different projections and under appropriate identifications, one can show that range of all these projections is the same operator system. 
So basically we go back to our original idea of operator systems and quantum graphs using these different projections. So in that way, all these uh, different ways of looking at quantum graphs converge to the same notion. So now let us look into each of the other two approaches that I mentioned. So uh, one way of looking at quantum graphs is by uh, quantizing the edge set. And so for that, we should first know about quantum relations. So um, a first a quantum set is a von Neumann algebra um, represented in some B of H. And then its commutant is defined to be the set of all those uh, operators in B of H, which commute with every element of N. Now, a quantum relation on this quantum vertex set M is defined to be a weak star closed subspace that is a bimodule over the commutant of M. So this is a very abstract definition when you look at it initially. But the way it was um, developed is by trying to uh, look at the non-commutative analog of classical relations on a set. So basically, if you just have a set V, then relations on the set V are just subsets of V cross V. And now if you uh, look at the quantum relations on that set L infinity of V you, using this definition, then you would see that it's exactly in one-to-one -one correspondence with subsets of V cross V. So that is the motivation why um, quantum relations are defined this way. So they're just analog, quantum analogs of classical relations. And the idea here is that this subspace S contains those operators which uh, connects to uh, adjacent vertices or connects to elements in the set that are related by that relation. So um, that is how you, um, that is how you would define this subspace S. And although it initially looks like um, it depends on the representation that we choose for the quantum set, one can show that this is also independent of the representation chosen. Okay, so once you have quantum relations, you can uh, talk about quantum graphs. So classically, you can think of the edge set of a graph as a subset of V cross V. So V is the vertex set and E is the edge set of the classical graph. So you can think of these edges as subsets of V cross V. And in particular, if the graph is reflexive and undirected, then this E is going to be a reflexive and symmetric relation on the vertex set V. So using this, we can define a quantum graph on a quantum vertex set to be a reflexive and symmetric quantum relation on the quantum vertex set M. So we are using the same conditions of reflexivity and symmetry, but in the language of quantum relations on the quantum vertex set, which is now a von Neumann algebra. And in this setting, reflexivity means that the identity operator belongs to the operator subspace S. So basically that means that the commutant itself is contained in S. And the symmetric condition in this setting means that S is closed under adjoint. And so if you combine these two conditions uh, with the definition of a quantum relation, this reduces to saying that a quantum graph is basically an operator space S, which is a weak star closed operator system because now it contains the identity and it's closed under a joint. So it becomes an operator system, which is a pi module over the commutant of M. So we see that it goes back to the operator system perspective. Now, another way of thinking about this is using uh, the non-commutative analog of the characteristic function on the edge set. So for this, let me first motivate the picture in the commutative setting. So if you begin with a classical graph G, so which has a, a vertex set V and an edge set E, then you can encode all this information uh, of this edge set using a function 
the characteristic function on E, which is an element of continuous functions on V cross V. Um, so this is a general idea in uh, non-commutative mathematics where you try to replace a structure by its function algebra and try to use functions in that space to encode all the information about objects in the original space. So that's what we are doing here. And so you can use some certain identifications to look at this function as an element of CV tensor CV. Now, um, there are some nice properties that this characteristic function satisfies. First thing is that it is an idempotent element. Second thing uh, is that the, it satisfies this reflexivity condition, which means that if you multiply the two components of the tensor product, uh, that gives you the unit element in the function algebra. So um, basically this means that the graph is reflexive. The classical graph G that you originally began with is reflexive. And then if this graph is undirected, then this means even if you swap the two components of the tensor product, you would still get back the original function. So uh, the symmetric condition of the graph is encoded by this uh, third condition here. So now when we are trying to replicate this structure in the non-commutative setting, we would like to carry forward these three properties. So what you can do is you define a quantum graph as a quantum, as a pair that contains a quantum set and a projection. So a quantum set is just a finite dimensional C-star algebra with a fixed racial state. And um, the projection is now going to be an element in this quantum set M, tensor M op, so the opposite algebra. And it satisfies these three conditions that we saw on the previous slide. So uh, it should be idempotent. Uh, this multiplication map on P should give you the unit element and the swap map on P should give back the same element. So the second condition tells us that the graph is reflexive and the third condition tells us that the graph is symmetric. And then again, you can go back to the operator system notion in this setting by some identification where you look at this projection as an element, um, as an operator on B of H. And then when you, under this identification, when you look at the range of the projection, it's going to be a weak star closed operator system. That's a bimodule over M prime. So it goes back to the quantum relations definition that we looked at earlier. So this is the second way of looking at quantum graphs. There is a third approach to quantum graphs using the quantum adjacency matrix. So in this case, you think of a quantum graph as a pair that contains a quantum set M and then an, a quantum adjacency matrix AG. So the quantum adjacency matrix is basically a linear map on this quantum vertex set that satisfies some natural conditions. So the first condition is idempotency, which means that uh, in the classical case, this would mean that if you had this adjacency matrix and you multiplied that adjacency matrix with itself point-wise, basically sure multiplication, just entry-wise, then it would give you the same adjacency matrix back because you only have zeros and ones. So that sure idempotency is what is this first condition. The second is the reflexivity of the graph. So in the classical case, if the graph is reflexive, then we would have ones along the diagonal of the adjacency matrix. So that is what the second condition means in the quantum language. And the third condition represents symmetry. So in the classical case, if the graph was, if the graph was uh, symmetric or undirected, then the adjacency matrix would be symmetric. So that is this third condition here. So the little m here is the multiplication map in this half algebra setting, and then eta is the unit map. Uh, and again, in this case, you can go back to projections and the operator system uh, notion using this uh, connection here. So you can define a projection and then using the adjacency matrix, and then look at the range of the projection, and that will give you the operator system. Um, and this is uh, a more interesting perspective because now 
using a quantum adjacency matrix, you can also talk about spectrum of a quantum graph and then try to generalize spectral, classical spectral results to this quantum setting. Okay, so in summary, there are different ways of looking at quantum graphs. And so here is, uh, here is a tabulation of those. So you can think of these as matrix quantum graphs or operator systems. You can look at it as quantum relations or as projections or as a quantum set with a quantum adjacency matrix. And in each case, there is a condition that represents idempotency of the adjacency matrix, the sure idempotency of the adjacency matrix, the reflexivity of the graph, uh, and then the undirectedness of the graph. So it's expressed in different ways depending on which approach you're using, but they all uh, kind of mean the same thing in each row. Okay, so that is the end of uh, like what quantum graphs are and what are the different ways of looking at them. Now moving on to a coloring problem that I'm currently working on. Um, so I am working on a graph coloring problem. Um, so graph coloring is basically an assignment of colors to vertices of a graph in such a way that two adjacent vertices do not get the same color. So if they're adjacent, they should necessarily get different colors. And if they're not adjacent, then they may or may not get the same color. But the least number of colors that you can use to color a given graph like this is known as its chromatic number. So I am interested in finding the chromatic quantum chromatic number of a quantum graph. So here is uh, an overview of the problem that I'm working on. In case of a classical graph, you can define a classical chromatic number and a quantum chromatic number. So the classical chromatic number is what I just defined. Um, for example, if you think of the US map as a classical graph where the states represent vertices and the borders represent edges, then the classical chromatic number would be the least number of colors that you need to um, color the US map in such a way that two adjacent states do not get the same color. So that is the classical chromatic number. Now there is also a notion of quantum chromatic number for a classical graph, which is defined using a non-local game. So a non-local game is where you have two players, Alice and Bob, uh, who are spatially separated and they are communicating with a referee the referee sends them some questions and they respond with answers and they have to coordinate in a certain way that they meet the rules of the game and win each round of the game. So I'll define this game on the next slide, but you define a, a graph coloring game and then the least number of colors that these two players use to win that game is known as its quantum chromatic number. So similarly, you can think about classical and quantum chromatic number for quantum graphs. So for a quantum graph, the classical chromatic number is defined using a basis of, uh, using a partition of the um, basis of the quantum vertex set. So you try to partition that basis into independent subsets. And then from there you define different kinds of chromatic numbers. But then there is no notion of a quantum chromatic number for a quantum graph. So this fourth quadrant is uh, open. There are some, different ideas, but there is, um, there is not a consolidated version that would generalize all the existing chromatic numbers. So this is uh, what I am doing for my dissertation, trying to study quantum chromatic numbers for quantum graphs. So uh, one approach that we used is trying to, okay, so one approach that we tried to do is um, extend this coloring game to the quantum graph setting and then use this um, partition idea for the operator system. And so using these two quadrants, we tried to develop a notion for quantum chromatic number for a quantum graph. So first, what is the non-local graph coloring game? Uh, so you begin with a classical graph G that has a vertex set V and an edge set E. Um, so you, there is a referee for this game who sends questions to Alice and Bob. And for this particular game, the questions are basically vertices for the graph G. 
and then Alice and Bob need to respond with answers, uh, which are basically color assignments for these vertices. And so they send uh, the referee with their answers, but they're, not, but they're not allowed to communicate with one another during this process. Uh, so the way this game works is that the inputs for the game are the vertices and the outputs are color assignments. And then there is a rule function that they must meet. So basically they win a round uh, for the game if they satisfy these two conditions. So the first is that if they received adjacent vertices as their inputs, then they should respond with different colors. And if they receive the same vertex as inputs, then they should respond with the same color. So basically they are trying to assign colors to the vertices such that it is a classical coloring for the graph G. Uh, but they only have to win each round separately. So every round is independent of the previous round. But what is tricky here is that they cannot communicate with one another, which means that they do not know what was the other person's vertex or what was the output or color assignment that they picked. So it's really difficult to classically coordinate a game like this and try to respond in such a way that they have a coloring for the graph. Um, but using quantum strategies, one can actually win this game with fewer colors than you would need for a classical coloring of that graph. So now we try to generalize this game to the quantum graph setting. So first, uh, we need to know what is the classical coloring of a matrix quantum graph, or what is the classical coloring of an operator system. So if uh, you have a matrix quantum graph, which is basically an operator system in a matrix algebra, you say that it has a K coloring. If there is an orthonormal basis for the quantum vertex set um, and a partition of that basis into independent subsets. So independent subsets means um, it satisfies this orthogonality condition. So classically what it would mean is that um, that position, so basically um, all those vertices that can be given the same color belong to one of each of these sets. So all the red vertices go into S1, all the blue vertices go to S2 and so on. So you're trying to partition the basis into independent subsets. That's what this orthogonality condition means. And so combining these two together along with this, uh, this technicality of picking a clever basis for the operator system, you can actually define a non-local game. So this is just a lot of technical details of how to pick a clever basis for your operator system S satisfying some nice conditions, which is known as the quantum edge basis. And so once you have a quantum edge basis, you can define a non-local graph coloring game for the quantum graph. So you begin with a quantum graph S. So an operator system S over a quantum vertex at M embedded in MN uh, and you fix a basis for uh, for CN and then a quantum edge basis for the operator system picked in a nice way. And then you define the inputs of the game to be um, tensor products coming from this basis and outputs to be color assignments for a classical graph. And then the winning criteria for the game in this setting are these two conditions. So it's the same adjacency rule and then the synchronous condition. But, uh, but stated in this language of quantum graphs. So it has some orthogonality and some uh, commutant notions involved. But once you have this game defined, you can then define the quantum chromatic number to be the least number of colors that the players need to win this game using quantum strategies. So uh, with this notion, um, we could extend some of the classical results, for example, the four coloring theorem for quantum graphs in the algebraic model and so on. So this is a more um, technical side of the talk and I would have a whole talk in itself, but uh, uh, at this point I'll stop and then here are some references. So thank you for your attention.